<laughs> Welcome to Biff's Mystery Theater. I have many tales to tell you. Ghost stories, murder stories, and tales that will make your bones chill. <laughs> Join me, won't you? For theater of the mind, where you always have the best seat in the house. <laughs> Now close your eyes and turn off the lights. <laughs> Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The man in the striped pants and red galluses and celluloid collar is Master of Arts and Doctor of Medicine at Harvard University, as well as Irving, Professor of Chemistry and Mineralogy at this institution. Quite an educated man, a scholar. He has just turned on the faucet for a reason. He has just dissected a colleague, and he needs to wash away the blood. This is Thanksgiving week in the year 1849. The dissector's name, John W. Webster. The dissectees, George Parkman. Dr. Webster has just committed murder because Dr. Parkman was a stubborn man to the very end. And tonight, my report to you on the terrible deed of John White Webster and his crime that shocked a nation. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Thomas Highland. The place is the Massachusetts Medical College on Grove Street in Boston in the year 1849. The college was a three-story building, the top two floors of which were reserved as offices and studies for the faculty. Dr. Webster occupied two high-ceilinged rooms on the second floor, just below the suite occupied by Oliver Wendell Holmes. On the afternoon of November 23, Dr. Webster had a visitor a man much taller and heavier than him, a man of scholastic bearing, a man whose spectacle ribbon touched lightly his mutton-chop whiskers. His name, Dr. George Parkman. Doctor, lecturer, creditor. A man with a purpose. I want my money. You'll get it. When? When I've got it. I must tell you something, Dr. Webster. Oh, can't you just drink your tea and enjoy the afternoon? No? Very well, then. Tell me something, Dr. Parkman. You're a dishonest man. Lovely autumn afternoon. A cheat. No surgery to do. A thief who beguiles his friends. I'm not only speaking for myself, you know. You mean you've been commissioned by my other creditors to come here and insult me? Now, Doctor, can't we just chat? Of course we can. Gentleman to gentleman. Doctor to doctor. Of course we can. Lemon, sugar, money. And what to chat about? Hmm, I know. In surgery yesterday morning, a most peculiar thing... You're an amazing man, Dr. Webster. You combine your great skill with being a great rascal. Oh, come now. I lent you $450 as mortgage on your property. And you turn around and mortgage it again. Someone else for $600. How can you do such a thing? Quite simply. I need a sum of $1,000, and my property is not worth that much. Good day, Doctor. Dr. Parkman. Yes? Are you going to the police? Yes. 
You disgrace me. I don't care about the results. I do. Dr. Park. Don't plead with me. Of course not. I've something in the kitchen I want to give you. It's about time. Quite. I should not have waited this long. Come along. Dr. Parkman, you couldn't give me an extension of a few weeks Certainly on... not. Certainly not. Just give me my money now. <gasps> I have no money to give you. And you want to disgrace me. And I see no other way. Don't be a fool. No other way. <laughs> and so Dr. Webster killed Dr. Parkman. And, as I have indicated, Dr. Parkman died hard. At this precise time, the murderer must have observed several moments of contemplation and reflection on what he had done. To consider it, to assess it, and being an intelligent man, an evaluation of the mess he had gotten himself into. Such moments of intimate musings we cannot know, nor as gentlefolk should we intrude upon. So, give Dr. Webster his moments and let us perform a superficial examination upon the man biographically. I have here a copy of the Boston Herald of the day. It gives Dr. Webster a neat spread on the front page and says, among other things, this. He was born in Boston about the year 1788. He came from a family of considerable wealth and respectability. He received a most liberal education and adopted the profession of medicine. In 1833, he visited the gay metropolis of Paris, France, and afterwards went to the Azores. In 1837... He was elected Irving Professor in the University at Cambridge, Massachusetts. When his father died, he inherited $40,000. <laughs> I would just like to depart from the paper for a moment to tell you that when he inherited this money, eggs were 12 cents a dozen. $40,000 which he wasted, which he threw heedlessly away into the vortex of fashionable life. Money went, debts came, and so on. Nothing novel. Money went, debts came. So did a wife and two children. So, having given Dr. Webster his moments, back to him now and observe him. Instrument of death still in hand. Pale. Still laboring for breath. Suddenly, a murderer. Instrument of death, no longer in his hand. But no less a murderer. Hello, Dr. Webster. Well, I... I'm here. You haven't forgotten, have you? Uh, what? The tea. You said come to tea. Oh, yes, 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 I remember. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Uh, no. But you said come to tea, and you said you would sell me a ticket to your lectures. Oh, I'm sorry. Come in, come in. Sit down, my dear. Oh, you were teasing. The tea things are all ready, and you've, you've already poured. Miss Montgomery, my dear. Yes, Doctor? Drink your tea, and the tickets are five dollars for three lectures. I know how much the tickets are. And you know what? What? You've forgotten the cream. I know where the cream is in the kitchen. Uh, Miss Montgomery? Yes, Doctor, dear? You don't want tea, do you? Not really. Then pay for your tickets and get out. Are you serious? Yes. There will be a vacant seat in the front row for your next three lectures. Goodbye. Mr. Littlefield. Uh, Mr. Littlefield, I said... Uh, I heard what you said, Doctor. 
How are you? All right. And how are things with you, Mr. Littlefield? Uh, what do you mean, Doctor? Well... Uh, in the janitoring line, you mean? Uh, that's right. Well, it's the same as it's been for the last seven years. Janitoring in a medical college like this, things don't change much. Oh, I see. One day... Is... Just like yesterday. Except today. Oh? You did something strange today. How could... You came down here in the basement and talked to me today. First time in seven years you've done more than say hello to me. Oh, I am sorry. I've been rude. Yeah. You're a doctor. So many things on your mind. Hmm. Uh, I'd like for you to help me with something, Mr. Littlefield. What? Well, if you were to play a prank on someone, hide something from someone so that someone would never find what you hid... <laughs> Where would you hide it? You mean around here? Yes. Oh, lots of places. Just a minute, I'll look to the furnace and I'll be glad to help you. It needs some coal. The furnace? What? It, it needs some coal. I just said that, Doctor. Yeah, no. I'll be glad to show you some nice hiding places, Doctor. Come on along. Yeah. What are you figuring on hiding? Now, that would be telling, wouldn't it? Big? Small? Oh, kind of like this? Medium, huh? Yes, I would say so. Fine. Just follow me, Doctor. <laughs> where I come whenever one of you doctors tells me to store his old records. Hmm. It's a large room, isn't it? Let's go inside. Up here in the attic, no one ever disturbs these old storage crates. Huh? Oh, time for me to be going home, Dr. Webster. A few more places, Mr. Littlefield. so forth. A lot of places, good hiding places, rarely visited, if ever. So Dr. Webster shook the hand of Ephraim Littlefield, thanked him, and bade him good night. Not at all, Doctor. Don't mention it. And Dr. Webster went back to his apartment on the second floor of the building. No melodrama. The body of Dr. Parkman was still on the kitchen floor, and there was work to do. Light the candles, turn on the faucet, and get to work. Man at work. Dr. John W. Webster, Master of Arts, Doctor of Medicine, Surgeon. Dr. Webster by candlelight. Finish making the tour, downstairs, upstairs, further upstairs, the attic. At two o'clock in the morning, and so forth, work done. And the next morning, about ten, according to the records. Good morning, Mr. Littlefield. Good morning, Doctor. How are you? Same as yesterday. Well, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, isn't it? Same as last year. So, what are you planning to do to celebrate? Same as everybody else. Dinner? Oh, sure. At home? Uh, here is something for you, Mr. Littlefield. Why? Oh, go on, take it. It's ten dollars. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you, Doctor. And I want you to buy a nice fat turkey and everything that goes with it. I certainly will. I, uh, <coughs> thank you again, Doctor. And uh, very much. Happy Thanksgiving, Mr. Littlefield. Happy Thanksgiving, Doctor.
Then they shook hands again and bade each other goodbye again. And the Thanksgiving season was upon them. are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Moliere wrote a delightful comedy about a man who was not a doctor, but whose wife kept telling everybody he was. It's a physician in spite of himself. Hear it later tonight on the Summer Theater with screen actor Robert Young in the starring role. Remember, it's the Summer Theater on most of these same CBS radio stations later tonight. And now once again, Thomas Hyland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the terrible deed of Dr. Webster. Let's talk about Boston for a moment, a city of genteel culture and tradition, and in 1849... The bookstores were advertising a cultural tome entitled The Runaway Wife, A Tale of Intrigue and Passion. And during the Thanksgiving week, Boston was enjoying the festival that it had practically invented. Here and there in Boston, a man named Dr. George Parkman was missed. But to take his place in the minds of men was celery, turkey, oysters, pumpkin pie, and quince. I would like to add parenthetically that Dr. Parkman was dead. And the only person who was sure of this fact was Dr. Webster, his killer. The same Dr. Webster who at this moment, cold steel in hand, carves surgically from the turkey's sternum and passes them the second helping of white meat to Mrs. Webster. Now you may pass your mother the celery, Mary Ann. Martha? Yes, dear? The oyster stuffing is succulent. Oh, thank you, dear. You and I and the children, we have much to be thankful for. You're a kind husband, that's why. You provide. Pass the squash. Mary Ann, pass your father the squash. Hmm. I'll get it. Yes, sir? Good afternoon, Doctor. I'm so sorry to disturb you. Yes, what is it? Well, I'm from the police, sir. Cliver. Daniel Cliver. Oh, please come in. Well, I see you're having your Thanksgiving dinner. I don't want to disturb you. Oh, do come in. Come in. Won't you join us? Well, thank you, no, sir. What, uh, what may I do for you? Is Dr. Parkman here? He, uh, seems to be missing from his usual haunts. Oh, John. And, uh... Uh, what is it? Uh, Dr. Parkman is missing from his usual haunts. And I thought you might give us some information as to his whereabouts, sir. Me? Well, two days ago, he was seen going into your study at the college. Two days ago. Two days ago, that would be Tuesday. No. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Tuesday, he visited with me, and we had tea. Stayed for perhaps uh, an hour, and then left. You're sure of that, Doctor? Well, sir, in situations where it is important to be certain, physicians such as I can be counted on to respond with accuracy. Well, uh, Tuesday, uh... Mr. Cliver. Since that time, I have not seen Dr. Parkman. Will you have some sherry? Thank you, sir. No, I... I'm sorry I disturbed you, sir. Dr. Parkman not seen in his usual haunts. I wonder where he can be. I can't imagine. Marianne, pass the yams. Homey scene in Boston, Thanksgiving Day, 1849. Typical festive scene, and I suppose typical too, for Boston men whose deeds of murder are two days old. And janitors have holidays too, and families and groaning boards. Mr. Littlefield, for example, in his small brick house in Cambridge, near the college. 
care for more dark meat, Mrs. Littlefield? No, don't mind if I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you are. Juiciest bird we've ever had to table. Juiciest. What did you say, Mrs. Littlefield? <laughs> Juiciest. You know, Mrs. Littlefield, it still worries me. About the turkey? The sudden generosity of Dr. Webster. I, uh... It, it bothers me why he should have given me the money for this dinner. Eat, Ephraim. Thinking is a bad sauce for a tasty dish. Still, a man who hasn't spoken a civil word to me in seven years to give me a gift and to ask me of hiding places. Eat, Ephraim. And the thing now of Dr. Parkman, each year for the last seven at Thanksgiving time, he hands me a dollar. This year, he did not. I haven't seen him. Not for two days now. I wonder... What you imagining? Mrs. Littlefield? Yes? I better speak to people. That's what. That's right, Dr. Jackson. Me and my wife were talking it over. And I'm happy you came to me, Mr. Littlefield. Yeah, kind of putting one and one together we were over Dr. Webster's turkey, so to speak, if you know what I mean. I know very well what you mean. Dr. Webster's asking about those hiding places. And uh, Dr. Parkman's disappearance, both happening at the same time. One and one together, I see. What do you think, Doctor? Time for action, Mr. Littlefield. Let's call on Dr. Bigelow, and the three of us will seek an answer. Forces gather. Forces conspiring to destroy Dr. Webster. The Furies, the Fates, and their names, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Bigelow and the man of the gratuitous turkey, Mr. Littlefield. And, as is common in classic tragedy, the pursued senses of feeling in the air. All is not right. Something is amiss. Forces are gathering. Dr. Webster felt it. He tried the air the following morning, sniffed at it, oh. sensed it immediately. Oh, my. What's wrong, dear? Uh, nothing. But you look so pale. Nothing wrong. A kiss, dear. I'm going to work. Oh, something's wrong. I'm sure of it. And having kissed his wife and sniffed the air again to make sure, Dr. Webster didn't go to work at all. Instead, he called a hansom gave the driver an address and was driven to a more or less fashionable part of town, gave the driver his fare, received a wink in return, and knocked on a door. Why, Dr. Webster. Hello, my dear. I'm honored. Please come in. I really didn't mean it, you know. Mean what? About not coming to your lectures, I... I wouldn't miss them for the world. I've come to give you your tickets. Here. Thank you. They're free. <laughs> Miss Montgomery. Yes? When Dr. Parkman left my apartment the other day, Tuesday... What? Just after you came in, didn't Dr. Parkman look... Dr. Parkman? Didn't he look nice, in good health, robust? Springy step. You you recall you remarked on his springy step? I? Yes. Oh, you've done something naughty. What have you done? First tell me what happened when you came to my study at the college Tuesday to buy tickets. Well, I knocked on your door. Uh, very good. You opened it for me. Good. Bade me enter. Yes. Introduced me to Dr. Parkman, who was just leaving. Oh. Excellent. We watched him go. And you said? My, what a springy step Dr. Parkman has. Bravo, bravo. 
Don't be troubled, Dr. Dear. I'm your friend. Your very good friend. Which was nice, because if ever a doctor needed a friend, his name was Dr. Webster. Because let's not forget the Furies, the Fates, the two physicians and the curious janitor who have gathered and discussed a certain hypothesis and came to an agreement. Let's take a walk around the building. And they did. Downstairs. Upstairs. Further upstairs, the attic. Three o'clock, gentlemen. I guess we know all we need to know. Jackson and oh, give this intrusion upon your study, Dr. Webster. We've been waiting for you. I have the keys. I let these gentlemen in. You? I didn't give you permission to do that, Mr. Littlefield. Uh, you know Dr. Bigelow, of course, Doctor. And I've heard you've met Mr. Cliver of the Boston Police. Gentlemen, will you take over, Mr. Cliver? Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Dr. Webster. Yes, sir. We found Dr. Parkman, or rather, these gentlemen did, and they called me. They showed me where Dr. Parkman was. I see. How is he? Come now. The last time I saw Dr. Parkman, he was the picture of health, a man with a springy step. You are under arrest, Dr. Webster. And they took Dr. Webster away, and they locked him up and held a trial for him, and in spite of his protestations, found him guilty. I must tell you, too, that Miss Montgomery, shy girl that she must have been, completely disappeared in the face of adversity. While waiting for final sentence to be pronounced by the governor and counsel, Dr. Webster maintained his usual good spirits, partook heartily of the food afforded him by his friends, and generally behaved himself. Then the sentence was handed down. He was to be hanged. Oh, no. By the neck until he was dead. I confess that I killed Dr. Parkman. There. That makes up for something, doesn't it? On August 31, 1850. Doesn't it? And that's when he was hanged. For a deed of blood. For a murder most foul. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Dr. Webster, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Jay Novello is heard as Dr. Webster. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Martha Wentworth, Jean Howell, Herb Butterfield, Junius Matthews, and Larry Thor. Bob Lamont speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, St. Joseph, Missouri, on a hot April day in 1882. The time? The exact moment when Jesse James turned his back on Charlie and Bob Ford. And my report to you on the death of a picture hanger. Thank you.
Good night. The profitable end of the rainbow is always in view of Bill Cullen's lively quiz show, Walk a Mile. Contestants have four opportunities, each representing a quarter of a mile, to make good on this fun-packed show. If they can walk a mile, they're in line for the jackpot. I'll tell you what, instead of us talking about it, why not listen for Walk a Mile later this evening on most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for Gary Moore with Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, there's action as a policeman really finds it in 21st Precinct, Tuesdays, on the CBS Radio Network. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The man is nailing a horse's picture to the wall. The horse is pawing the western skies in the classic attitude of pawing horses, and it is the top half of a calendar distributed by Isaac's livery. It's a hot April day in St. Joseph, Missouri, in the year 1882, and the man is hanging the picture in his living room because he has a fondness for the noble beast. Horses have got him out of many a critical situation, such as one, holding up railroads, two, robbing banks, three, murdering fellows. His name is Jesse James. And as soon as he finishes hanging that picture, a friend of his is going to shoot the back of his head off. So tonight, my transcribed report to you on the death of a picture hanger. Crime Classics, a new series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence... And teller of murders. Now, once again, Thomas Highland. Tonight, we take you to Jefferson City, Missouri to the mansion of the governor of that state. His name was Crittenden, but his cronies called him Critch. He liked living in the governor's mansion because he never had it so good. There were servants, crystal chandeliers, wine furnished by cronies, entertainments by cronies, and best of all, six small gilded cherubs, backs bent cheerfully to support a cast iron bathtub, and quite often the governor also. So if you've never attended the governor taking a bath... Here's your chance. Uh, where's that soap? Where is it? Well, there it is, Critch. Ah. Right behind you. Uh, sir. Uh-huh? Uh, when's the last time you had a bath? Uh, Kansas City. Just after the hanging of Billy Bob Williams. You see, that was, uh... March 12th, last. <laughs> what a memory you got, Governor. Yeah, hanging outlaws, one of the nicest parts of this job, Timberlake. <laughs> You ever get to be governor, hang a lot of outlaws and remember when. That way you can tell people and people will be impressed and keep you governor. I'll remember. Uh, hand me that rose water and glycerin, sir. Oh, sure. Oh, nice. Mm. Uh, you, you know what I called you down here for? Got an idea. Tell me, and I'll tell you if you're right. Jesse James? Look good on my record. He to die somehow soon. During my administration in my state. People will cheer you wherever you go. They like the sound of people cheering. Governor. Hand me the towel, sir. Oh. Uh, thanks. Governor, I've been thinking... Scheming kind of thinking? Well, you might say. About Jesse? If it works, people are able to cheer you right on to Washington. <laughs> then there's no telling what. In a case like that, you're liable to be standing right where I'm standing. That's right. Get Jesse for me. I'm going to do that. Hmm. 
Not since Kansas City, huh, Sheriff? Not since then. Well, how'd you like to take a bath right now? I didn't want to say nothing. I uh, I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> She's all yours, Sheriff. Enjoy yourself. Sheriff Timberlake was a man who instinctively knew his way around a bathtub. He soaked, lathered, and rinsed, and was out of there in the shake of a lamb's tail. Then he went home. Then he changed his clothes. He got into a nondescript outfit of brown woolen pants and a black alpaca coat. And he went down to Kansas City. Many things were to be found in Kansas City. A wooden monument, long since burned, of Daniel Sanker, who got a message through to his beleaguered dad. A grand opera house. And three mechanical pianos, each with fiddle attached. All in all, it was a very happy community. Worthy of note is the fact that Spit in the Ocean, a poker variation, was invented at Bobrick's Poker Palace during this era. And it is into this very den that Sheriff Timberlake wandered. He wandered here because he was looking for someone. A girl. A young lady whose job it was to stand in back of strangers at the gaming tables and make signals to the houseman on the opposite side. When Timberlake approached her... She had three fingers in the air and the tip of her tongue pointing to the left. Maddie. Oh. Up here, Hunter. Want to talk with you, Maddie? A second. Raise you. Carl. I get me a one-eyed jack in the hole. Gives me three of them. Where'd you say you're from? Roanoke? Nice place. Come on. Out here. What you want? How's Johnny? You said you weren't going to turn him in. For favors. What you want him to do? Nothing. What you want? Jesse James. Oh. Got to clean up Missouri, Matty. Oh? Got to start with Jesse. If you say it. Here, Jesse's staying with Robert and Charlie Ford. That's right. Now, your friends, ain't they, Matty? Robert and Charlie Ford? I used to know them pretty good. Ain't hard to talk to old friends, Matty. And you ain't gonna touch Johnny, are you? You just tell Robert and Charlie Ford I'm at Stan Pony's boarding house right now. I ain't got a gun either. That all you want me to do? You tell them, Matty. You hear? Open. Come on in, boys. Well, didn't Maddie tell you I left my guns back in Jefferson City? Just you come on in. Bob, over there. All right. Glad to see you back in Missouri, Charlie. Heard you and Robert were over in Kansas for a while. Heard you're in jail. Heard you killed a man to get out. Glad to see you back in Missouri. Bob, get him. All right. I told you I weren't holding no iron, boys. Making sure. Take your shirt off him, Bob. Now let him go, Bob. How come you ain't holding nothing, Sheriff? Now you know what I'm going to say, you believe. Come on back here, Bob. Where you was before. All right. Sheriff, you crazy? Let me ask you a question, then you decide. How'd you like a full pardon for what you've done in Missouri, Charlie? Robert, you need never go back into Kansas. You're free to stay here as long as you live. Come and go as you please. Don't have to worry about killing four people in Missouri. Besides, have $10,000. You've been robbing, you've been stealing, you've been killing. You got ten dollars between you? Both of you, murderers, thieves, scum. (laughs) 
I figured you'd do that. I'm glad you did. Because now you're hating yourself. Put your gun back, Bob. Let him run on a little bit more. You like Jesse James, Charlie? Ain't nothing about him I like or don't like. You like Jesse, Robert? Man's talking to you, Robert. Wants to know you like Jesse. Do you? <laughs> Once Jesse and Bob had a little fight. Two years ago, Bob was only 19 and Jesse a full-grown man. When Jesse was finished with Bob, Bob got to be a full-grown man. The governor wants Jesse dead or alive. A lot of people do. Governor says he'd give both of you a full pardon and $10,000 for Jesse. Ain't no bargain, Jesse being who he is. Gunfighter like he is. And fast like Whatever he is. Whoever do it, be a hero. People cheer. That'd be nice. What'd you say, Robert? That'd be nice. Ride with the governor. That'd be nice. <laughs> being a hero instead of a running dog. I like that word. Hero? Yeah. Robert? Yeah? Say it. Hero. <laughs> now, what's the matter? Listen to what I can say. Ten thousand dollars. Well, boys? Jesse James died all of a sudden. Wouldn't take long for you to hear about it. We'd let you know. That's a promise. Chain reaction. Governor in bathtub, sheriff in waiting, Matty the girl card watcher, and the brothers Ford, Robert, and Charlie. The principals involved in getting Jesse James assassinated. It would be well at this point to remark upon some of the accomplishments of Jesse James. His standard feat was murdering cowboys and rustling cattle. One incident in Star County, Texas, had him murdering single-handedly three cowboys and driving off 500 fine head of beef. A record which stands to this day. On record, too, is his slaying by Bowie Knife of Mr. John W. Wicker, a Pinkerton man from Chicago. Then there were several train robberies, outstanding of which was the one five miles east of Council Bluffs, where he and his men derailed the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Express. The cars telescoped. The engineer was instantly killed. Twelve passengers were seriously injured. And Jesse and his men... Rob them all. There are many other mayhems too numerous to mention, except that they averaged 1.37 corpses per exploit. One act of kindness must be noted, however. Mr. Avery Thompson, hurt grievously by a runaway horse in the streets of Abilene, pleaded to be put out of his misery. From 50 paces, Jesse obliged. His act of mercy was applauded by all around. It was then this half-kind, half-renegade person that the brothers Ford were going to kill. Charlie and Robert went home, lit the kerosene lamp, and waited. They didn't have to wait too long. Hi, Jesse. Come on in. It was a Saturday night when Jesse walked through that doorway in Ray County, and Sunday was his favorite day because he could sleep late.
You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Tomorrow night, if you're in the mood for still more adventure listening, don't miss 21st Precinct, the program that probes the inner workings of the world's largest police force. 21st Precinct shows you policemen as the human beings they are, exposes their tough grinds, their dangerous careers. Remember, it's Tuesday nights on most of these same stations, presented by CBS Radio. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on The Death of a Picture Hanger. The night Jesse James walked into the Ford home, he was carrying a 45 Colt on one hip, 45 Smith Wesson on the other, and a 44 Derringer in his waistcoat, and a Winchester rifle hung limply from his left hand. Armed in this manner was standard operating procedure for Jesse when he walked into homes, a procedure which varied only some years before when he courted. At this time of romance, he did not wear the Derringer. It should be remarked, however, that the Winchester was kept by his feet like a faithful old dog. All of which adds up to the fact that all of the people who tried before this Saturday night to kill Jesse were long dead. And the Ford boys, Robert and Charlie, were well aware of this fact. But Robert wanted to be a hero. And Charlie wanted $10,000. So they were very hospitable. Sit in the rocker, Jess. Uh, want some whiskey? Bob. Heard you have been in Jefferson City, Jess. Here you are, Jess. You must be sleepy, Jess. What's the matter with you, Bob? You don't have to tell Jess when he's sleepy. Jess knows when he's sleepy. I just don't Jess... want to talk important things to him, that's all. Not when his head's nodding. Simmer down, Bob. All right, Jess, I'll tell you. We're tired of lazing around. Me and Charlie have been doing nothing, just waiting for you to say go. When are you going to say go, Jess? <laughs> kids anxious, Jess. Just like kids. You're tired, that's all. Yeah. Been on my back like this for a week, Jess. Worrisome, ain't he? Listen, Jess, we figured something. A train, Jess. Trains are easy. You hear what he said? You hear what he said, Charlie? Trains are easy. Kid. The Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific out of Kansas City. It makes a stop at Winston, Jess. At Cameron, too. Here's your drink, Jess. We gonna do it to the train, Jess? Need some sleep. Bob, fix just that place in the barn. Sure. Sure will. So Bob went out to the barn, fluffed up some straw, and made a bed for Jesse to sleep in. This was considered an act of compassion of the time. Barn owners to wayfarers. But in this instance, it was known as a tactic. Get Jesse on his back in the barn with maybe his guns off. Get him while he's sleeping. So consider now what we have here. Jesse James bedded down for the night and his two would-be assassins as guardian angels. In the trade, this is known as a precarious position. So switch now from prone Jesse to outside the barn. Nearly midnight in Missouri and a mist from the river threading between Charlie Ford... And Bob. When are we going to kill Jess? Try killing him from now on. You think he's sleeping? Where'd you bet him down? Under that window. Well, let's go peek, see if he's sleeping. What you think? He's lying there, all right. Eyes closed. Can't tell. I sure tell this, son. What? I'm in that pool of moon. Wait a minute, I gotta get away. See? He's 
he's holding a gun in each hand. He's a light sleeper. When he sleeps. We don't even know he's sleeping. Charlie. Hmm. Shoot him. Kill him. You want to be the hero, younger brother. You do. This is supposing I miss. I'll shoot you just where you're standing if you miss. Because if you miss, you ain't Jess. And I'll just explain to Jess I killed you to save his life. I always say the mine. If we were sure he's sleeping, it'd be no trouble at all. You make sure. If some kind of animal or something walked by in the soft, that'd be a way. Hey, you wait here a minute. Come here, you little old dog. That's right. You're too old to live anyhow. Little dog's too old to live anyhow, Charlie. Step aside a minute. I'll push him through this chink in the wall. Critter run into the barn past, yes, and we'll find out for sure. Oh, shit, I'm like a woman, Bob. Just do it. Bob and Charlie huddled together that night, and in the morning they flashed their nicest, sleepiest grins when they awoke to find Jesse James standing over them. I shot me this critter last night. Who's going to cook me my breakfast? The boys tumbled out of bed and vied who would be first at the skillet. Bob won, and Charlie put the kettle on. It was late, and it was Sunday, so they had brunch. Toward its end, as a gesture of carefree camaraderie, Jesse heaved the Ford's best china against the wall. Breaking them against the wall's easy, Jess. Why don't you throw them up in the air and shoot them? You crazy, Bob. What'd you tell him to do that for? He used up all his bullets and then we... <laughs> Watch it, Jess! <laughs> Ain't gonna hit you, Bob. Just seeing how close I can come. Yeah, in the name of heaven, Jess! Cut it out, Jesse. You got the kid almost crying. Stand still. See how you like it, Charlie. See if I can fan your ear without drawing blood. <laughs> now let's go do it to a train. Which meant riding down to Winston. Which meant for the Ford boys a constant vigilance for the moment when Jesse would turn his back, would ride ahead of them a few paces. Anything so that they could have an irretrievable advantage. Historians make category of this event as the ride to Winston with the Fords up front. Jesse just didn't trust anybody to ride in back of him, except his mom, but then she was only comfortable on very slow horses. So down to Winston they rode, and at 9.30 p.m. on Monday night, they boarded the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific train. As soon as the train started, they dressed themselves in white linen dusters. They wore red handkerchiefs over their faces, and they waited in the vestibule for the conductor. Fifteen minutes later, Jesse James and the Fords left behind them two corpses, a wounded engineer, and an empty duck cage, the boys having released a dozen ducks from the express car. They took with them $8,000 in cash and convertible mementos. The boys jumped off the train at a point where they had tethered their horses. Then they rode south. They rode to St. Joseph, Missouri. They rode to the home of Jesse James, with Jesse riding behind. Wait out here, boys. Sure. I'm in the kitchen. Oh, hello, Jess. Don't you kiss me now, Ann. You wait till I wash off this road dust. I don't mind. You're too pretty to get mussed up. Oh, Jess. What you got there, Ann? I was in Isaac's today to see about some harness. He gave me this calendar. <laughs> he said, you put this up in a nice place, Mrs. Howard. Everybody in town calls you Mrs. Howard, don't they, Ann? They call us the Happy Howards. They ask what you do, I say a traveling man. You been traveling, Jess? I brought your watch, Mrs. Howard. Here. Why, Mr. Howard, 
Porcelain and gold. Just what I wanted. Now you go away, Marshal. I can kiss you. What you doing to that calendar, Jess? Pretty picture of a horse, Ann. Tear off the calendar part. It'll look nice in the parlor. Nail it up in the parlor, Ann. Some tacks and a hammer in the cabinet. Brought the Ford boys with me, Ann. Oh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. I'll have the boys come in. You make us something to eat. I'll fetch you some water first for washing. Come on in, boys. You boys like this picture? Right good picture of a horse. What are you going to do with it, Jess? Figure to hang it here somewhere. I wouldn't want me a picture of no horse in the parlor. You just ain't got no eye. No, he ain't. Yeah, I, I think hanging a picture like that's real good. Where are you going to hang it, Jess? Here, I guess. Uh, that's too low to hang a picture. Yeah. Higher, huh? Mm, I had me that picture, and I was going to hang it. I'd hang it high. Mm, maybe you're right. Pleasant to be home. How's your missus? Pleasant to be home. Man don't have to carry around all these guns weighing heavy around his middle. Feels mighty fine. I said, how's your missus, Jess? Getting water. Gonna cook us something. Get off that chair, Bob. What for? You stupid. I said I was gonna hang me this picture. All right. Pretty picture. Bob. All right. All right, Charlie. He shot the back of Jesse's head off, Bob. That make me a hero, don't it? Sure does. Shooting Mr. Howard, alias Jesse James, in the back was a very heroic deed. So heroic that a song was written about it. The refrain goes, And the dirty little coward, he shot Mr. Howard and laid Jesse James in his grave. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Death of a Picture Hanger, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Clayton Post was heard as Jess, Paul Fries as Charlie, and Sam Edwards as Bob. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Charlotte Lawrence, Paula Winslow, and Joseph Granby. Roy Rowan speaking. Now, here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, a bedroom in Baltimore, Maryland, in June 1871. Its occupant, William Scott Ketchum, Major General, United States Army, retired. My report to you will be on the final day of General Ketchum and how he died. Thank you. Good night. Later this evening, Herbert Marshall has the leading role in a story adapted from Daphne du Maurier's collection called Kiss Me Again, Stranger. It's the eerie story of the birds, describing strange happenings on an otherwise quiet English countryside. Hear it later this evening on most of these same stations when CBS Radio presents The Summer Theater. 
Yes, later this evening, starring Herbert Marshall. Stay tuned now for Gary Moore with Arthur Godfrey's Talon Scouts, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, for mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Good evening. This is Crime Factor. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The general just fell out of bed. His name? William Scott Ketchum, Major General, United States Army, retired. So that there'll be no mistake, this is the same William Scott Ketchum who led the famed Ketchum's Raiders against the Seminoles in 1842, who was acting inspector general of the Department of the Missouri, and the one who did such a bang-up job of recruiting in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, during the Civil War. The general is in agony. In protest against the quick ebb of his life, he's kicking the floor. The general is dead. And tonight, my transcribed report to you on the final day of General Ketchum and how he died. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now once again, Thomas Highland. The year is 1871. The place is Baltimore, Maryland. The month, June. No poet in the world, to my knowledge, has ever written a poem about this month in Baltimore. It is hot, it is humid, and the oysters are not in season. And any almanac will show you that in June 1871, had oysters been in season, with eggs and breadcrumbs, they could have been fried on the sidewalks. For most Baltimoreans, it was the season for dipping hands into tepid scrub water to wash the marble stoops. It was the season for sleeping on back porches and Druid Hill Park, the time of sweat and the hand fan, and the usual quota of elderly stout folk dropping dead from the heat. In short, it was a time to get out of there. In a certain house near Charles Street, a lady was preparing to do just that. Her name? Mrs. Wharton. And she was packing to go to Europe. Coming, 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 coming. General. Mrs. Wharton. How nice. How very pleasant. Do come in, do. May I present Mrs. Chubb? Delighted. Oh, do come in, you and the general. I've been cooling myself with iced dandelion wine. Do join me. I do not imbibe. I work for the United States Department of the Treasury. Mrs. Chubb needs to keep a clear head at all times. I used to work for the United States Post Office Department, but now I'm with the Treasury. My, that's interesting. And you came all the way from Washington with the general. Perhaps your next position will be with the army. My dear Mrs. Wharton, I must talk to you. Of course. Uh, Will you pardon us, Mrs. Chubb? Is this where you talk to her about the money she owes you? Mrs. Chubb. Twenty-six hundred dollars. Isn't that what you told me, General? Why don't you pay the General his money, Mrs. Wharton? Mrs. Wharton? Yes? As long as the cat is out of the bag, I thought to bring along the note you signed. I understand you're going to Europe. Get the money, dearie. Why... I have a distinct recollection, General, of having reimbursed She's going to tell you she's paid you the money. Let's not embarrass each other. But there's really no hurry, is there? There's no train back to Washington for hours. Wouldn't you like some wine? I do not imbibe. Just a small glass? You just sit down and relax. 
I'll bring you the wine and we'll chat. You might stop at the cookie jar too, dearie, for the $2,600. The heat in Baltimore wasn't bad enough, but what the only breeze was an ill wind that blew in from Washington. From the point of view of Mrs. Wharton, that is. It should be remarked that Mrs. Wharton was no chicken. She was 50 years old and at an age when petty tribulations could easily bring on an attack of the vapors. Now consider. Here she was packing to go to Europe. And if you remember, just a moment ago, she was happily singing. Now descends upon her people who ask her for money. Certainly conducive to vapors, if anything was. But Mrs. Wharton, true to the noble tradition of Baltimore women of whom I might mention the fabulous Eulalie Bracken, the belle of the Rappahannock, did not permit herself the vapors under duress. Instead, she went directly to her wine cabinet. Right here, and for the next ten minutes, history only serves up to us a vacuum. We do know, however, that when Mrs. Wharton returned to her guests, carrying a goblet of wine for the general, this remark was made. What took you so long, Mrs. Wharton? Did you stop at the cookie jar, dearie? General. Your health, ladies. And yours, General. Oh, my, yes. <sighs> General. What are you doing on the floor, General? Uh, I can't get up, Mrs. Chubb. Please. What is it, General? Uh, call a physician. I'm ill. <laughs> How's my patient now? Feeling better? Dr. Chu? Yes? You must do something for me. Anything, anything, General. Convey to Mrs. Wharton my apologies. Tell her I'm so ashamed of myself for falling down on her rug. And tell Mrs. Chubbs to find a room in town. And Dr. Chu? Anything, anything, General. Tell Mrs. Chubb to stay there. Of course. General? Yes? You know what's wrong with you? What? I don't know. I thought perhaps you did. I thought perhaps you had had a previous diagnosis. I thought perhaps this was a recurring ailment. I haven't ailed a day in my life, except... Out with it. Except when I was in the swamp chasing the Seminoles. Then I was sick most of the time. Ah. Yes? In the swamps. Cholera. Cholera morbus. And your present symptoms. Sweating, purplishness, weakness, and debility. Cholera morbus recurrent type. Is that very serious? Rest easy. I have the very thing in my bag. You're going to feel like a new man as soon as you take this. By looking stuff. Why is it that all you army men quail at the sight of medicine? Here, drink this, General. No, I'm not going to drink it. General, drink come that. on, open. I don't want to General. Yeah, here. here's some water. Drink it. What kind of medicine was that? Creosote and lime water. How do you feel? It seems... Uh, yes? Suddenly, the foreignness is gone. Good, very good. May I get up now? Oh, no. You'll be in bed until tomorrow, at least. I'll have Mrs. Wharton fetch you a prescription, which will work wonders. Goodbye, General. Mrs. Wharton! Coming, 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 coming. I have a message for Mrs. Chubb. Where is she? Must I reveal... Well, I do have a message for her. She imbibed. She can't stop. She's in the rose garden now. I can't get her out of there. But then... Tell her to take a room and stay there. General's orders. And how is the general? He says his furriness is gone. Splendid. I gave him a palliative, a temporary relief. Is he seriously ill? She isn't young anymore, you know. There are no small sicknesses when one gets to be his age. And I'm afraid he can't be moved. He'll have to stay here at your house. But of course, he can stay in my room. I'll use the guest room. And an errand for you, Mrs. Wharton, to the druggists. Get some tincture of yellow jasmine and give him a tablespoonful every two hours. Tincture of yellow jasmine every two hours. Goodbye, Mrs. Wharton. Goodbye, Dr. Chu. <laughs> Mrs. 
So Mrs. Wharton, dressed prettily, took parasol to hand and strolled down Charles Street. She walked slowly because of the heat and because Charles Street is a fashionable street. And one is apt to meet many of one's friends. And one is apt to stop and pass the time of day. Why, yes, Mrs. Becker. General Ketchum just fell right over. Right there in my parlor. And she strolled some more. And to Miss Celia Bradshaw, an old friend of hers from picnic days, who she saw waiting on a corner. You never guess, Celia, who's dying in my house. At least I think he's dying. Dr. Chu wouldn't confess it, but I have a premonition. The general's dying. General Ketchum. And at the druggist's, she took time to down a sherbet. Seltzer water was all the rage in Baltimore in this era, so she had a little of it with a squeeze of lemon. Then she walked over to the druggist and ordered... Tincture of yellow jasmine, sir. And while you're at it, I'd like some tartar emetic. I'm in pain. I hurt. Mrs. Wharton, please, hurry. Mrs. Wharton! Coming, 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 coming. And here we are. Oh, my stomach. The doctor said as soon as you drink this, you'll feel no pain. Please, please, hurry. Now here, drink this. All of it? Every drop. Come on. Uh, Now, General, just a moment ago you were begging for it. Now, every drop, all the way down, the whole glass. Uh, General, General, watch out. You'll fall out of bed. You... General, what's the matter? General, you look... General. The general was dead. Frontiersman, recruiter, quartermaster, dead on the floor. Fini to a military career. And it was then and only then that Mrs. Wharton had the vapors. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. Tomorrow night, get a grip on your favorite armchair and let that sleuthing twosome Mr. and Mrs. North face the dangers on their latest murder case. You're invited to solve it if you can, but from where you sit, the dangers will be strictly theoretical. Remember, every Tuesday night on most of these same stations, you have a date with Pam and Jerry North, CBS Radio's family of detectives. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the final day of General Ketchum and how he died. A few words about Baltimore, Maryland, of the era which concerns us. Even in the 1870s, it was one of the medical centers of the world. It is known as the home of the crab cake. Sidney Lanier, Edgar Allan Poe, Henri de Rochefort, alias the French butcher. And, as is well known, has given its name to a bird, the Oriole. It is a city of row houses and marble stoops and beautiful women. If from Baltimore, all the more, one of the rapier wits of the time had it of the beauty of the city's damoiselles. It is known that in her earlier days, Mrs. Morton met neatly the qualifications of the adage, and at 50, she was not to be sneezed at. However, at this precise instant, we may safely assume that the lady presented an appearance somewhat less than comely. For a general had just tumbled out of her bed and died. Fright, horror, dismay, 
But a few of the things this gentle lady must have experienced, and how nice could a gentle lady look under such circumstances, she was leaning against a bedpost, pressing her temples. From the front door. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wharton. Oh, Mr. Van Ness, quickly, come in. You look so pale. Look, look in my bedroom. What? Look in my bedroom. Uh, did you lose something or what? Please, do as I tell you. All right. Oh. He looks terrible, Mrs. Wharton. Why? He's dead. He can't be. Please don't be stupid, Mr. Van Ness. He's dead. He was ill and he died. But when I saw the general this morning, he looked so robust. You saw him this morning? Why? He came to check your accounts with me. Oh? As your solicitor, I was only too happy to, to discuss them with him. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what, Mr. Van Ness? That you were in the general's debt to the tune of $2,600. I paid him back immediately. Do you have the note you signed? Did he return it to you when you paid him? Why do you ask? He showed me a note this morning. He said he wanted his money. I knew nothing about it, so he said he would see you. He saw me. He tore up the note. Tore it up? Why? Did you pay him? No. He tore it up as a, a sailing gift to me. To see me happily on my way to Europe. Do you have any witnesses of the transaction? No. That is not good. Mrs. Wharton. Yes? There was a lady with the general this morning. Come to the window, Mr. Vanis. See? There. Where? There, under the Empress Eugenie Rosebush. Why, it's Mrs. Trubb. She imbibed. Well, she told me she never did. She said she was employed by the United States. As my solicitor, you must tell me. What shall be done now? I must tell you that I will have to report this of the $2,600. Of course you do. And you must be very distressed, Mr. Vanning. Yes. Yes, I am. Do sit down. I'll fetch you something to drink. All right. I'll only be a moment. Your favorite. Thank you. <clears throat> I am happy to report to you that Mr. Van Ness regained consciousness an hour later. He rose to his feet and looked about him. He was quite alone. Through a window, he could see the setting sun. He could also see Mrs. Wharton's rose garden. And in it, Mrs. Wharton, her arms about the waist of Mrs. Chubb, of the United States Department of the Treasury. And the two ladies were walking about the rose bushes. Whenever Mrs. Chubb would stumble, Mrs. Wharton would dab at her face with a handkerchief and a sister to her feet. Mr. Van Ness let his gaze drift from the bucolic scene and went immediately into the boudoir, where was the corpse of General Ketchum. Mr. Van Ness determined that that promissory note which he had seen earlier that day was not upon the general's person. So he took himself to the police and to them made charges. And the charges? Murder. But I murdered no one. The general took ill at my house as Dr. Chu. The general was sick, all right. I diagnosed it as Coromorbus recurrent type. The general having been sickly in the Everglades. So you see... I didn't murder the general. Why should I? Because you owed him $2,600. He tore up the note as a gift. You were with him alone when he was dead. You could have destroyed the note yourself. And you call yourself a gentleman. And you call yourself a lady. I am a lady. I work for the United States. Of course. She drank of the same wine that did the general. And you too, Mr. Van Ness. You got tipsy... And all that happened to her was a few scratches, thorns, Empress Eugenie Rosebush thorns. Well, I, I don't know what came over me. Oh, there, dear, there, there. <laughs> you're so sweet, Mrs. Wharton. When you're in Baltimore, my house is your house. 
murderess. However, Mrs. Wharton was charged with suspicion of murder, and immediately a more detailed statement was taken from Dr. Chu. Cholera morbus, recurrent type. More? Oh, when I was first called to attend General Ketchum, I found the sick man in a semi-comatose state. The pupils of the eye were of a natural size, but almost wholly insensible to light. When I prepared the dose of medicine, I found the general's teeth so clenched that it was a matter of considerable difficulty and adroit convincing to put it in his mouth. His furriness, furriness, uh, gentlemen, the haziness of manner vanished almost immediately. I gave then Mrs. Wharton a prescription calling for a tincture of yellow jasmine. And the druggist was questioned. Oh, yes, I remember vividly the occasion. Mrs. Wharton entered my store, had a sherbet, some seltzer water over a dash of lemon for heat, tincture of yellow jasmine, and tartar emetic. A word about tartar emetic. It is a deadly poison. I use it externally for wrinkles. As did many ladies of the time. Next came the autopsy. The general's stomach was removed and examined. Two of the greatest internalists of the day, Dr. Williams and Dr. Aiken of the Maryland University, could not agree as to the causes of death by a superficial examination, so it was sent to a chemical laboratory at the Johns Hopkins University. And upon the analysis depended the fate of a lady who just wanted to go to Europe. <laughs> of course, the flagellation wasn't complete, but that's the way it happened. <laughs> All right, hand it to me. I'll put it through the filter. <laughs> Filtrate. Thank you. I'll wager Dr. Imhoff was astounded, wasn't he? <laughs> he thought he discovered something. He was prepared to call it the Imhoff effect. <laughs> Attach this to the uh, hydrogen sulfide, will you? You know what? What? This is the closest I've ever been to a general. His stomach in an Erlenmeyer flask. I did a prima donna once, poisoned by a jealous mother, arsenic she used. You should have seen the titration on that one. Precipitated. I'll get it. Here. You separate. I say no poison. I say poison for one dollar. How do we stand now? Mm, you owe me three from the last two analyses. They had me the muriatic acid. Thank you. Ammonium sulfide? Oh, my. Orange red, Joe. Tartar emetic in the stomach, wouldn't you say? Tartar emetic? Chalk gives the same reaction. Plain, everyday chalk. That's the way my report is going to read. Chalk in the general stomach. So they gave their report to the city solicitor's office. Each different. One tartar emetic, the other chalk, which confused the city solicitor no end, for not one hour before he had read a report from another chemist, Professor R.S. McCullough. Professor McCullough, having examined a like portion of the general stomach, averred that not a trace of tartar emetic was to be found, nor chalk, but a bit of chicken Maryland. Confusion. The while, Mrs. Wharton, detained in prison, had a visitor. I bake these myself, dear Mrs. Wharton. Dear Mrs. Chubb, they're wrong about you, what they're saying. What are they saying? That you poisoned him. And others are saying that you would not, that you're too much of a gentle lady. Do you remember, dear Mrs. Chubb, when you came to my house, you drank from the same bottle as did the general? Did I? Of course you did. Remember? Wasn't it from another bottle I drank? And at a different time? <laughs> you... You are a tease, Mrs. Chubb. <laughs> Did I tell you there was no Mr. Chubb? I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. Three years ago, he ate a bad crab. And you are alone, as I am. Oh, I dislike Washington. When we return from Europe, you'll come to live with me. Dear Mrs. Wharton, and I have something else to tell you. Professor McCullough examined the general's stomach. 
The professor said the general had not been poisoned. What transpired next, I have in a journal of the day. It is headlined with Doctors Disagree, Learned Men of Science at Variance, Several Schools of Thought. I quote, Dr. Reese, when interviewed, stated that General Ketchum died from cerebral spinal meningitis. On the other hand, Dr. Edward Warren stated that the general had not died from cerebral spinal meningitis. Dr. John R. McClurg attested that the general died of apoplexy from congestion. Dr. Abram Claude clings to the school of tartar emetic poisoning. And Dr. Josiah Simpson, dean of Baltimore Physicians, has made this statement. I believe the general died from natural causes. On December 4, 1871, the case went to trial. And possibly because of the conflicting testimony, Mrs. Wharton was acquitted. And thus it is that the true cause of the general's death is not known. Nor does history record whether Mrs. Wharton and her dear friend Mrs. Chubb ever got to Europe. But Mrs. Wharton's home, her abode wherein the general died, still stands. I expect you think I'll tell you that today the house is haunted. Well, it is, but not by the general. By Claude Forrester, who was the victim of an unsolved axe murder some 20 years later. The general has been forgotten. Until, I hope, tonight. just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. General Ketchum, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program was transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrow. In tonight's story, Paula Winslow was heard as Mrs. Wharton and Russell Simpson as the general. Featured in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Bill Bissell, Sarah Selby, Hi Averback, and David Young. George Walsh speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Cretfield in the county of Suffolk in England. The years from 1793 to 1804. And the dreadful murders of a father and daughter. Also including a description of the instrument of death. My report to you will be on Mr. Thrower's... Hammer. Thank you. Good night. Arthur Godfrey himself will be back in action with the Talent Scouts later tonight. In fact, on most of these same stations, the great event takes place immediately after station identification. So stay tuned and join the whole family. CBS Radio from coast to coast. To make it a big welcome home for our always a cut-up, especially so recently, Arthur Godfrey. And remember, Bill Cullen's Walk a Mile show is heard Monday evenings on the CBS Radio Network.